Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to this uh, public uh, webinar on the lasting consequences of uh, COVID-19. And so this is a joint event. Uh, my name is Inkel Alger, by the way, and uh, I'm here to, to introduce uh, this, uh, today's speakers and to tell you about how uh, this event will proceed. So it's, uh, it's a joint event organized by the Toulouse School of Economics and the Institute for Advanced Study in Toulouse. So the Toulouse School of Economics is a uh, research center and education uh, center uh, in economics at the University of uh, Toulouse. And the Institute for Advanced Study is an interdisciplinary research uh, center hosted by uh, the Toulouse School of Economics. Uh, today's speakers are both uh, professors in economics at TEC and also actively involved in the uh, IAST. Before I introduce our first speaker, I would like, however, to uh, tell you how this hour will be structured. So uh, each speaker will, will talk for uh, 15 minutes. And after each 15 minute talk, there will be a five minute uh, window for questions on, on the talk. Those questions will be uh, in writing only. At the end, after the two 15 minute talks plus the five minute Q&A time, at the end there will be ample time for further questions. And uh, in the end, uh, hopefully there will also be some time for questions that you may ask uh, orally. But uh, let me tell you how you can ask questions uh, in the meantime. So those of you who are uh, on with here, here with us on Zoom, you may ask questions in the Q&A window. Uh, those of you who are uh, following this on Facebook can ask questions in the comments uh, to the video and those comments will then be copied and pasted into the q a in the zoom uh, in, in the zoom and finally you can also ask questions on twitter by uh, using the hashtag uh, hashtag tsc debate and by the way those of you who are here with us today on zoom i invite you to uh, have the Q&A um, window open. So even if you're not asking questions, you can like questions and so that the most popular questions will automatically come at, towards the top and uh, will be asked in, in preferentially in that order. Um, okay, so also actually, apart from questions, uh, both of our speakers today will, will ask uh, you all to provide some input and they will tell you exactly how to do this. But just to let you know, give you a heads up, they will ask you to log in to a website called menti.com. So that's M-E-N-T-I.com and they will ask you some questions and you will see the results of the, these polls that they will uh, thus, uh, hold, you will see the re results of the polls in real time on the slides. Okay, so uh, let's start now the presentation. So the first speaker is Victor Gay. So Victor is a, um, an economics professor at TEC who specializes on the role of historical institutions and events for long run economic growth. And Victor will talk about the economic impact of COVID-19. Uh, the floor is yours, Victor. Thank you very much, Ingela, for this introduction. Can you hear me correctly? Okay, uh, so let me share my screen uh, for my presentation. Okay. Okay, can you see my screen correctly? Okay, so let me start. So during my uh, intervention, I'm going to talk about uh, the economic impact of COVID-19 and uh, more precisely from a historical perspective. So without any doubt, I think that we can say that we're living today the worst health and economic crisis of the 21st century. So as of today, we have about 1.3 million confirmed deaths from COVID-19 and about 55 million confirmed cases here. And the main reason for that is that we, we have no natural immunity uh, to this disease and there is no cure yet. So there are some vaccines 
as we heard last week, that are near to completion, but are not available yet. Here. And so this has generated uh, two types of crisis. So first was a health crisis, which uh, was which government tried to uh, to stop using large scale non pharmaceutical interventions, uh, but this. In, in turn, degenerated into a large economic downturn due to those interventions. And that's kind of a unique feature of the, of the crisis we're in, is the combination of these, these two phenomena. So during this uh, short presentation, I'm going to try to provide you a historical perspective about what past uh, historical events can teach us about the likely long-run consequences of, of this crisis here. So uh, we can attack this from, from two angles. The, the health crisis angle and the economic crisis angle. So I'm going to start with the health crisis uh, angle here. Uh, and so the idea is to try to find some commonalities with past epidemics here. So the, this, uh, this plot um, shows you reproduction rates and case fatalities rates for past epidemics. So um, reproduction rates are really are the expected number of cases directly generated by one case in a population that has no immunity here. So you can see that the graph in the graph, it, it ranges from zero to 20. So those are estimates. So there is a range of uncertainty around them, but they provide some form of um, order of magnitude. And you can see it goes uh, from the avian flu, which has a relatively low reproduction rate to measles, which has a relatively high uh, reproduction rate. And the case fatalities rate is the number of confirmed deaths divided by the number of confirmed cases here. And you see also, a wide uh, range here. So we still, the, um, the epidemiological crisis is still de currently developing, but what we think uh, now um, about COVID-19 is that we're in the, somewhere in the yellow square here. So there is some uncertainty around this, maybe a bit more on the right or um, a bit more on top, but uh, broadly speaking, we should be in this area here. And as you can see, one of the more common uh, comparable disease that we have with COVID-19, especially in terms of um, um, types, types of symptoms that you have, is the influence of uh, 1918. So I'm going to use this, draw, try to draw some historical lessons from, from this case here. Right, so um, what can we say about uh, the influenza epidemic of 1918? So it was a relatively brief, brief uh, pandemic, which lasted about for two years, uh, but something that is also common with the current crisis is its uh, worldwide uh, diffusion. Uh, so it's unclear from where it originated, perhaps from the United States, but what's clear is that it, it, it propagated pretty fast uh, all over the world. And here those are again some estimates, but it is estimated that it, between 20 and 50 million people died um, during this crisis here. And also in common with today, there were some non-pharmaceutical inter interventions, for instance, in the US, um, with social distancing measures and lockdowns, partial lockdowns, but they were rather uh, limited here. So what can we draw from, from this case? Uh, here I'm going to focus on the case of the US and what researchers in economic history um, have done on this case. The reason is that uh, you have better data on the US case in terms of um, uh, disease and mortality measures. And also very importantly, this coincided at the time of the, uh, the end of World War I. And so for this reason, it's extremely difficult to assess uh, the consequences of this epidemic in continental Europe because you had World War I on the soil of continental Europe here. So that's why I'm going to focus on the US case. Also, the magnitude of the disease of the epidemic in the US was rather large with the, from six, 600 to 700,000 deaths from this disease in 1980. So um, the first thing you might ask about the, cons the consequences of, of this health crisis is um, which populations were the most sensitive to this crisis? Uh, and here is a question I would like to ask you uh, before I show you what researchers have to say on this. So one question is, what were the most important determinants of the excess mortality across US cities in 1918? And so one question is, were those populations that were had the worst baseline health, more susceptible to the disease, or was it about something about income, or was it about proximity to military bases, uh, which, so, which some people think that might have contributed to the diffusion of this disease, or was it uh, some environmental quality, baseline and air quality? So here I'm going to ask you, as Ingela said, to go on um, www.met.com. You just have to enter uh, this URL um, 
on your browser and just enter the code uh, that's on the screen here, 8410642, and you can choose and we can uh, see what people think about that. Uh, and those results should um, theoretically appear. Uh, surprisingly, uh, a very low number of people think uh, baseline air quality was important. Okay, so let, let me show you what, what researchers uh, think about that. Let me try to share my screen from, uh, so where is it? Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes, okay, <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, okay, so uh, here, is, here is what researchers have, have found. Okay, so let me explain you what it is. So um, in a very interesting recent study, Clay Lewis and Severnini uh, gathered information uh, from uh, 400 or so uh, US cities, the larger ones, uh, and gathered information on excess mortality from the pandemic, from this disease, and various city level characteristics. And they run a, what's called a multivariate, uh, multivariate regression. But essentially, what, what they do is to compare excess mortality rates across cities uh, that have different uh, characteristics. So to make results kind of easy to interpret, they divide cities in third size uh, between characteristics. So cities with high, medium, and low infant mortality rates before the pandemic, high, medium, and low literacy rates before the pandemic, et cetera. So what you see here are estimates uh, that compare high versus low and medium versus low uh, excess mortality rates across these characteristics once everything, all the other um, all the other correlates are taken into account and partial of that. Okay. So this is the independent yeah. correlation. Victor, can I just ask, there's a clarification question. Can you yes. just define what baseline, what you mean by baseline? Oh, sorry, baseline is um, before the pandemic itself. Sorry, yes. So do places that were initially, that had higher infant mortality rates initially, which means that they, they had worse um, health conditions, worse health environment, where they're more, did you, can you observe more, ex, more mortality from the disease in those places later on? That's the idea. The idea is that you, you measure those uh, characteristics before um, the pandemic hit. So what you see as people uh, were kind of right is, the most two important determinants are, appear to be uh, pre-war, uh, sorry, pre-pandemic health conditions and pre-pandemic uh, illiteracy share. So there is a limited uh, number of data available here. So infant mortality is some uh, approximation for the health environment and illiteracy rates is approximation for the for income income levels. You can see that cities that were in the high group in terms of infant mortality had about 20 or so uh, more deaths per. 10,000 persons compared to the low group here. And for medium, for cities in the medium, uh, in the medium range, it was about eight or nine relative to the low group. And you can see that income and health, those baseline characteristics are about equal contributors um, to excess mortality. However, once those are taken into account, there is a very limited evidence for, um, for a role of the proximity of, of uh, military bases. Also, it appears that um, the environmental quality was not that much correlated with excess mortality. So, from there, what we what we can get what, what we can get is a, is um, um, some policy recommendations on, on which population which populations to target, uh, both to prevent the spread of the spread of the of the epidemic and also which population that were likely more affected. Although this might not appear in the statistics. statistics. Yes. So here overall, so what researchers have found is that the influenza of 1918, uh, 1919 uh, aggravated pre-pandemic socioeconomic disparities. So this is something important that we can draw from history and we can really, we can really have some clear policy recommendations here, I think. All right, so now what about the very long run effects here? And so there are a series of very interesting studies that try to assess uh, whether uh, being born during the pandemic in 1918 uh, dramatically affected your long run uh, life path. Okay? So Dugelman has a very interesting study in 2006 where um, he kind of implements, uh, try to test uh, this hypothesis. And so here it's a version of that hypothesis where you take people in 1970, so who are 50 years old, about 50 years old in the US censuses, 
and you compare some of their characteristics depending on their quarter of birth here. And so here you have these plots which uh, represent the share of this population that is disabled in 1970 when they are 50 years old as a function of their quarter of birth here. And the quarter Q4, Q3 corresponds to the time where these people were in utero um, during the pandemic. And so people who are about here, so who uh, were in utero earlier or after these points were not subject, it was not during the epidemic. Okay. And what you can see directly um, is that, so first you have a downward trend in, in the share of people who are disabled over time. Okay. It just means that the level of, um, the level, the, a level of uh, economic prosperity is, is just growing and people are getting better over time if you're born a bit later. But what you can see is that there is a deviation from the trend uh, for those people here. This deviation might, might look a bit small because it's just 1%, percent, one percentage point compared to the, to the long run trend here. But however, it's a really a long time after, so it's, it's about 50 years uh, later on. So it really means that you have long run scarring effects. And you can observe that on a wide range of characteristics, but I just show you three. So this is a more direct health measure. But you can also see that reflected in um, the probability of dropping out of high school. So those people who were in utero during the, the influenza epidemic in the United States um, were more likely not to graduate from high school. And overall, this also reflects in income levels. So these people are slightly more likely uh, to be below the poverty level. Okay? So all this to say that um, these, these epidemics that we're living might have some very long run health and economic consequences, uh, scarring effects on, on people. Okay. So this was to, to discuss about, to provide some historical perspective on the health crisis. But we saw that this, what is specific about the current situation is the combination of the health and the economic crisis that was generated by those non-pharmaceutical interventions. And so here we have to think about, in history, an economic crisis. So um, the thing that most comes to mind directly to an economic historian is the Great Depression, which was um, until now, the largest uh, economic downturn that we observed in the, in the 20th century. And so it started in 1929 in the US, um, and broadly speaking, it, it, uh, it lasted until the early uh, 1940s and World War II. Okay. And here I'm going to ask the same question. Uh, can you observe some scarring effects? But I'm going to take a different angle, which is the angle of, is there a scarring effect when you enter the labor force during this crisis? And this is especially interesting to us, uh, uh, professors and teachers, uh, because, uh, because our students are going to go on the labor force um, uh, pretty soon. Okay. So here what's difficult is to kind of separate those effects that are common to everyone that is on the labor market uh, at the time from people who are just entering here. So these kind of age effects. So just to show you, this is, uh, those are some figures from, from Moulton, was an interesting study on that. Uh, these, two, these two figures show you uh, discontinuity in labor market conditions before and after the crisis of 1918. Okay. On the left hand side, you have a graph that shows you employment uh, in uh, the manu manufacturing sector uh, here. And you can see that uh, employment is broadly stable, somehow growing before 1930. Okay. But then there is a sharp drop right after the crisis. Okay. And then it takes about one decade to recover the pre currency levels. On the right hand side, it's, a, it's more about income and wages in the manufacturing sector. And you can see that wages were growing rapidly uh, before the Great Recession in the United States. And then you have an enormous drop here. And by 1940, uh, you have barely recovered the levels you had in 1920. Right. So once you take this into account the, this, and you partial them out, um, what you can do is try to compare people who entered the labor market right before 1930 versus right after 1930. And in the United States at the time, it corresponded more or less to people who were born around 1916. Okay. The reason is that at the time, um, it was legal to enter into the labor force at the end of grade eight, which corresponded to the age of 14, and most American people were actually doing that. And so if you focus on those people who left school at age 14, um, and they had no other opportunities to continue education. And if you compare, um, like before, before and after, those people born right before 1916, who presumably entered the labor force right before the Great Recession, to people who were born right after 1916 and presumably entered 
the labor force during the recession, and you look at their income long after. So here uh, you look at their income in 1940, so 10 years after the crisis. Uh, you can see that uh, you have discrepancy. However, it only occurs in those states. So high shock means it's the states that were the most severely hit by the economic crisis, and low shock is the the other half of the distribution of the states that were not that much affected by the economic crisis. So you see that nothing much, there is not much difference in those places that were not really affected by the crisis, but in those, those states that were most affected, you can see that 10 years later, people who were born right after 1916 had much lower income than those people born right before 1916. Um, and you can you also have evidence on that uh, about the Great Recession that happened in two, 2008. So you have some kind of long-lasting effects that can last for decades after the shock. So overall, I hope I convinced you that history can provide somehow a useful guide to, for policy in the current situation. And you can see that, uh, to summarize, um, low social economic status individuals really bear a disproportionate burden of the health crisis and also labor market entrance here. And you have, um, we have a lot of evidence of long lasting scaring effects. Uh, but of course, you know, we need to be really modest about what, can, what history can tell us uh, because of the original feature of COVID-19, which is the combination of these two crises, which didn't really happen in the past. Moreover, there, is, there are a lot of, of questions that we need to answer, which, uh, which is how those two features will interact. Okay? How will health and the economic crisis, with the economic crisis might generate in itself another health crisis. And also some original features that we didn't observe in the past for uh, young children due to school closures and also the, um, the uh, consequences for gender inequality, especially for working mothers. Uh, okay, thank you very much. And now uh, we have a few minutes for questions, um, if you want. Thank you very much, Victor. Yes, so we have five minutes of questions now. So uh, one question is, that you talked about in utero effects. And the question here is whether this is possibly perhaps instead related to the death of parents rather than in utero effects. Um, so, oh, sorry. Uh, whether, so let me come back to the relevance. Um, these here. Um, so here in this study, you take into account, so, because those are in utero, so those I don't think it's um, is driven by mothers who die during uh, uh, during childbirth, uh, although this is to verify. Uh, but um, I think it has been shown that you might have some selection potentially on who you know gave birth at this time. Uh, here, it's not really related to the health of the parents. I think it's more related to the military World War One military draft. So you had this argument that all these results were driven by uh, parents, so fathers. Um, who are not in the U.S., okay, uh, who are um, in, uh, in, uh, in Europe uh, waging war during the time the epidemic was there. And because of this selection, the pool of people who remained, the pool of parents who remained in the U.S. had lower social economic status than soldiers who actually left. Um, it has been shown um, by several studies that there is a little bit of this selection effects um, from the characters of the parents who did, um, of the fathers who didn't go to war, but it's extremely small and cannot really account uh, for this. So sure, to, to answer so surely, but it's not, um, it cannot really account for the larger results here. Okay. Another question is about using uh, infant mortality as a measure of poverty. Is that something that you have seen? Yeah, so, so here um, they're using, uh, in this study, they're using infant, infant mortality for, uh, to measure for an approximation of the health environment. Okay. They illiterate, the share of illiterate people is used um, as a more close approximation of the income of the, um, of the city in question. So of course it's far from perfect. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm not saying it's, it's perfect, but one issue that you have in economic history is that information at the city level in the US at the time for this time, um, you know, it's not widely available. So basically, you can use some sources, uh, you can use what you have. So I think it's more um, because you, you lack information on purely income and you lack information on other health measures that you use that here. Um, but I agree, those measures are somehow debatable. 
Uh, okay, thank you. Another question is about the graph that you showed about those who had reached the year of, uh, of uh, the age of 50. And the question is, what, how do you deal with those who died uh, prior to reaching that age? Well, that, that's, a, that's a very valid point. So here, uh, what you see is that those people who were actually alive uh, in 1917 who were alive at age 50. And as you can see, uh, it's fairly obvious here. Those are, so I like those graphs because those are raw data, okay? So, I mean, those are averages with, those, uh, with uh, a line that represents the, the long run trend. And so you can really see what's going on. But of course, and that's a very valid point, uh, there is a selection bias. If, uh, I mean, and it's obvious from the graph, um, people who are more likely to be disabled are more likely to die before the age of 50. So here we have a selection. And so actually what you can think, um, what, what you can think of is that, if anything, this, this, this deviation from the trend here is underestimated compared to the real deviation if those people didn't die, so to speak. Um, so I think that's a valid point, but if anything, it, it kind of, this, this plot kind of underestimates the true scaring effects um, of um, the pandemics. Okay, and then there is a question uh, about the fatality rate for syphilis that was up on your, one of your graphs. Oh, yeah. And so is this considered untreated syphilis? Because nowadays the case fatality should be very low. Yes. Um, here, I'm not entirely sure. Um, my, my, if I had to guess, is that those numbers are from the syphilis, um, the syphilis epidemics in the 19th century. Those are numbers from historical data. Uh, but I cannot be sure. Uh, yeah, my apologies. Okay, well, thank you very much, Victor. Thank you very much. And, um, now it's time for uh, Astrid Hoffenzitz to make her presentation. Uh, so Astrid is also an economics professor at TEC and um, actively involved at IST. Her uh, research focuses on the influence of emotions and other uh, so psychological traits on economic decision making. And her presentation is um, titled The Pandemic and Our Social Interactions. So please, Astrid, the floor is yours. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so I'll try to share my screen. Um, does this work? Yes. Yeah. I can hear you and I can see you. You can hear me, you can see me. I'll try if that's okay. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ingela, for this introduction. Uh, thank you, everybody, for being here. Um, so, my name is Astrid Hoptensitz. I'm a researcher in experimental and behavioral economics at the Toulouse School of Economics, and I'm also a member of the IST. So, and I wanted to talk about a little bit during this uh, 15 minutes about how this COVID pandemic has been influencing how we interact with each other um, uh, in, uh, in social interactions. Um, so, so for, for, for discussing that, one thing that we first have to think about is how this COVID uh, epidemic has been affecting us in general. And so first and foremost, obviously, there is this uh, novel disease, COVID, that we are still uh, largely uh, discovering what the effects uh, are, what the health consequences are of it. But even besides the immediate health consequences, uh, one of the big problems of this pandemic is obviously that it's spreading so fast. So that's also why there are so many of these interventions. And um, uh, talking about psychological effects of, of this COVID pandemic, obviously one of the first problems is uh, that those that have very mild symptoms, for example, or even no symptoms, might very well spread this uh, disease to others and then uh, afterwards feel guilty or shame about that. And so this obviously is a problem that we, we have to deal with and we, we, we have to take into account uh, concerning the long-term psychological consequences. But I don't want to focus so much on the direct effects, effects of those that catch the disease, but more on the general effects that this COVID pandemic has been having on how we interact around the world uh, these days. And um, one of the um, consequences, obviously, is that uh, this uh, pandemic has been uh, introducing new worries uh, concerning economics, uh, concerning health, um, 
And uh, one thing that uh, we know from psychological research and uh, research in economics is that uh, women are in generally uh, much more risk averse. So women uh, react very differently with respect to risk in general. And this is also something that we observed very early on during this pandemic, that there is a gender uh, difference in how people react to this pandemic. So women are generally much more likely to uh, react to the health recommendations, are more likely to wear masks, uh, to isolate, uh, to, to, to wash their hands and so on. So this, in addition with the things that uh, we, we know uh, concerning the economic consequences of the pandemic, namely that uh, many people have been losing their jobs, and this, this is all also uh, correlated with uh, sectors which are correlated with gender, has been leading to a, a very significant gender impact. So uh, all around the world, women have been pushed more into traditional gender roles. They've been staying at home more, taking care of children or uh, taking care of the homeschooling that obviously became important during the last months. So there has been this general worry, um, and this worry is not only there for adults, but obviously also there for children. And this is also something that a researcher has been starting to look into during the last months, um, uh, asking children uh, uh, from different countries how they've been experiencing this health crisis. And one thing that becomes apparent that they are very worried that they've been uh, uh, experiencing uh, depressive symptoms, um, um, that they've been suffering a lot also from the isolation, uh, not seeing their friends, not going to school and so on. And um, one thing that in general also comes out what helps really against all of these um, is uh, more information. So basically reducing the uncertainty, so making it more clear how you can prote protect yourself, how you can protect others, what are actually the consequences, is something that helps as well adults, but also children um, to deal with these uncertainties and these worries. So the third point um, is that obviously due to all of these uh, problems, um, people have been starting to isolate uh, during this pandemic all around the world, staying at home for extended periods of time. And uh, also from uh, questionnaires that the psychologists have been doing now for different countries, we see that people report much more uh, depressive symptoms uh, due to that. And this might be due to different causes. So for some, it might be because they feel isolated and lonely. For others, it might be because they're exposed to increased stress because they have to stay at home with, um, in, in, in crowded uh, housing maybe, uh, or, or, or with people that they um, have difficult uh, relationships with. And at the same time, this is obviously uh, important across the lifespan. So it's important for young people, for students, for example, that live in very small apartments and then in addition got blamed very often for the spread of the virus because people started to talk about these parties. And it's also very important for the old that are very often identified as high risk groups and were isolated for extended time periods and that suffered due to that very much. So in the beginning of the pandemic, people uh, said like, oh, this isolation might be actually a good thing for people that are rather introvert, uh, because uh, introverts uh, feel more comfortable uh, staying at home and, 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 and not having too much contact with others. But actually from the uh, questionnaires that have been done over the last months, it comes out that extroverts actually deal much better with this uh, kind of challenging situations. And that this is mainly due to the fact that extroverts usually are uh, much more optimistic and have a uh, op more optimistic outlook on, on life in general. And that they are also more motivated, even during such challenging times, to try to find alternative ways to stay in contact with their, with their social circles. And fourth, and this is the point I want to talk about today mainly, is that actually our everyday interactions have changed a lot during these last months. Uh, we've been staying at home a lot, we've been moving a lot of interactions online, we've been doing video calls, video conferences, teaching on Zoom and so on. And even if we meet people face to face in the street, for example, um, these interactions are uh, modified because most people now wear face masks and we are uh, instructed to keep uh, social distances. So we hug much less, we touch each other much less. So a lot of these things have changed. 
So let me um, talk a little bit about what's actually happening when we usually interact with others. So in pre-COVID time, so to speak, when we meet people, um, one of the most important things actually when we meet others is usually that we look in their faces. Um, and uh, faces are actually uh, psychologically really, really important for humans, which is evidenced by the fact that even a few hour old babies already um, can uh, see a, a, or know, uh, detect a, a human face and focus on this face. And even adults, if you see, for example, an advertising with a human in it, then uh, usually you focus on the face uh, first. So if we see a face, we see obviously lots of things in these faces. We see the expression, we see the characteristics of this person. But also one thing that is very important when we see people is we see where they look. So this also is something very human. We have the white around our eyes, which enables us actually to detect where the focus of someone is. And this is actually very important, for example, when I want to teach something. So if I want to teach someone how to use a certain object, I will um, keep switching my own attention between looking at this object and looking at the person I want to teach to, to see whether this person is actually looking at the object or at myself or at someone else. And this kind of joint attention, so the fact that I know that you look at the same thing and that you know that I also look at the same thing is actually very, very important for, for effective teaching because only that way we can be sure that our message gets across. Now third, if we talk, actually uh, communication is usually not an abstract back and forth, like I talk, you talk, I talk, but it's a constant back and forth and uh, parallel dance of lots of little signals that get sent back and forth. So people are nodding, they're giving little sounds like, mm -hmm, they're laughing. And all of this is very important for successful communication because it sends signals to the person that's speaking. Um, that their message is uh, well received. It also enables the listener to, to send these attention getters like, oh, I want to say something, I, didn't, I do not agree, or I didn't understand something that enables a successful communication. Now, obviously, during these uh, COVID times, we are interacting now increasingly through screens, and we might wonder what is all changing there. So obviously, when I see someone on a screen, I'm, I s might see where they are looking, but actually, this is not really informative. So if someone looks away on a screen uh, from me, this doesn't tell me that this person is not focusing on me. It might be just because the camera and the screen are maybe badly aligned. Also, I, as doing an online uh, co conversation, usually we don't get these small signals, this laughter, these sounds. Mm -hmm. This might be rather because, uh, either because uh, microphones are muted, there might be a bad connection and even if uh, I get the signal but there are multiple people involved in the communication um, usually it's very hard to see who sends me the signal because all of these signals come from the computer to myself so I cannot detect who is sending me these signals. So this is why these uh, interactions on screens are very often so frustrating for speakers because they do not know whether their message gets across and why they're also very often so frustrating for the audience because they don't, cannot intervene as quickly or as spontaneously as they would um, naturally. Now, one other thing that we do when we usually interact with people is we decide um, whether we want to trust these people or not. And trust is enormously important for any kind of economic interaction. So this is uh, just a graph that shows you um, the uh, scatter plot between uh, GDP per capita for different countries and average uh, answers to a, a general uh, trust question. So asking how much do you think in general can people be trusted? And uh, this is a, a result, of, uh, result often observed is that the, there is a positive correlation between the two. And this is um, just one evidence that actually if we, for any kind of economic interaction, we actually need some kind of trust. We need a trust that uh, uh, money is worth something. We need trust that the seller is giving us the product. We need uh, the trust that the buyer pays and so on. So if we meet someone and we have to decide whether we want to trust this person, what do we do? So one way to decide whether we want to trust someone is obviously to use our own previous experience to, as, as a signal for that, or we might use reputation, for example, by third parties telling us, uh, 
either directly or use a rating system, for example, online, whether this is a trustworthy interaction partner. But in many situations, we do not have any of these informations. And um, one thing that we base ourselves a lot when we uh, need to decide whether we want to trust someone or not is the face. So how do we decide whether we want to trust someone? So actually there is one very easy way how you can make yourself look more trustworthy. It's simply by smiling. So here you have two pictures of a, of a young woman. On one she looks slightly grumpy, on the other one she's smiling. And you notice that on the smiling picture, she looks much more attractive, but also uh, people consider this person to look, look much more trustworthy on the smiling picture. So this you see, for example, with these kind of scatter plots. These are uh, this, uh, the same person that took a happy picture and an angry looking picture. And then people rated the trustworthiness of this person. And you see that the uh, ratings are usually higher for the happy photograph. So actually in a normal face-to-face -face interaction, if I see someone smiling or being in a good mood, um, then this is actually informative because it tells me something about how this person might react with respect to myself. However, if online I'm doing an interaction with someone and I see just a smiling photograph, this is not really informative for myself because this photograph doesn't mean that the person is actually feeling happy or being in a good mood right now. And so this, um, for example, is uh, linked to one of our recent uh, studies where we were uh, wondering whether actually people use this kind of signals in a strategic way. So I'm an experimental economist. So for this, we invited uh, participants to come to a, a laboratory environment where they played the roles of either uh, what we call a manager or employees. And the manager um, had a very abstract task that he had to uh, give to one of these two employees. And we varied basically whether this was task was either a desirable task, so a task that you wanted to get, or an undesirable task, so a task that you would rather not want to get. So these people were uh, anonymous, they didn't know each other beforehand. Um, but what uh, these employees could do during this study was they could take a photograph of themselves and send this photograph to the manager before the manager uh, took their decision. Now, we looked at these photographs and we basically um, analyzed um, how much people smile on these photographs. And um, so these are results from two studies. So on the first uh, experiment, you see that on, when the task that people are competing for is basically something attractive, a desirable task, they're smiling much more, so they're displaying much more um, uh, positive valence than if they're competing for basically something that they would rather not want to have as a task. So basically people understand the strategic nature of smiling or to expressing certain kind of emotions. And so this means that our everyday interactions right now that inhibit these kind of signals really um, uh, are changed. So um, obviously even during the COVID pandemic, we're not only interacting through screens, we also have face-to-face -face interactions. However, the strange thing during these face-to-face -face interactions actually that is that we usually do not really see the face of people because most people nowadays wear masks. And so this is linked to another ongoing study that uh, we're uh, currently doing right now, um, where we're interested in uh, the question whether people actually can detect uh, the facial expressions of people that wear face masks, and whether they can actually detect smiles of people um, that wear masks. And so for that, I would like to invite you to do actually a very short, um, Oops, yeah, a very short uh, question again on Menti, as Victor has done it uh, in the first part. So you can go to uh, www.menti.com, use the code that's uh, shown there on the top of the screen. And um, actually, my question is uh, which of these, on which of these two pictures, the same person in this case, obviously, is the person smiling? And um, I'll let you a little bit of time to look at it, respond to it. Um, you know, answers should come in. Okay. I'll wait for two more seconds.
Okay, so I don't know if other people are responding, but actually from this, you already see that it's actually a, a, a very clear vote for the left picture. Um, and it's true on the left picture, uh, Cesar, this is actually one of my colleagues is smiling. However, what's the strange thing is if you look at the photographs, there are actually only very, very tiny differences. There are almost imperceptible differences between these two photographs. And still most people have actually an intuition on which of these two uh, uh, photographs someone is smiling. Um, so if you see the same person, this is actually kind of easy because you see them um, side to side, you can actually really compare it. It becomes a bit more difficult if you just see the person once. Um, and so this is actually some, one thing that we are currently um, investigating. Um, oops, here we go. This is something we are currently investigating. Um, so if you're interested, I invite you to participate in our survey that's currently ongoing. So this is uh, the link to it. So it's a tsc freu slash S-U-Y-M, so smile under your mask. It's a very short survey that takes uh, maybe five to 10 minutes. And uh, with this survey, I hope we can study how people are interacting, even during this kind of st strange, uh, modified social interaction during this pandemic. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Astrid. So there is one uh, question here in the Q&A. Um, window. So the meaning of trust is very context specific. Yeah. How is trust measured in cross country comparisons? Um, so the, the, the data that I showed you from this, uh, from this graph, this is basically, um, right. I can show you that again. So this is basically um, a question that comes from the world value survey which is a survey that's uh, used across lots of different uh, countries uh, and so on. So I don't say this is the best uh, way to, to, to measure trust, but it's basically a very general question that just says, um, uh, how much do you agree with the statement most people can be trusted? So it's not, uh, the, the question is not context specific, so if it doesn't give any context, it just leaves it open. But indeed it depends on the context. Okay, thank you. The, uh, another question is, so in the comparison that you show there between these two pictures, you had yeah. one smiling and not the other one not smiling. Uh, the question is whether you also look at what people answer if you just show one picture and you ask, is the person smiling or not smiling? Yes, so indeed. So this is one of the things uh, we're, we're actually interested in. Um, so so I, I, I made it a little bit easy here maybe by giving the, the two pictures side by side because you can really compare it. But actually what we want to see is rather how people just react to seeing a person without having such a comparison. Because yes, indeed, you don't see the person twice in front of you and you can make the comparison which, which of the two is the smiling one, but you have to decide kind of spontaneously is this person uh, uh, smiling or not. But what you can see basically, there are, there are um, lots of muscles that we have around the eyes. Um, and these kind of muscles are, are, are very much active when we are smiling. And uh, we're actually surprisingly good in detecting these kind of muscle activities uh, to detect if someone is, is smiling or not. Okay, thank you. So in terms of uh, questions here in the Q&A window, I don't not see any more questions. So I think we'll now open the floor for a general Q&A to both speakers. Yeah. And um, should I stop sharing? I think, yeah, that would be good. I think if you okay. stop sharing the slides. Um, and Caroline. Yes, so we, we don't have any, any questions right now. No questions, okay. Just, just to answer, the, so the slides will be available on our website, um, tsc.fr.eu, and you can see the video on our Facebook page or we'll post it on YouTube. If there are no other questions, I can ask. 
If anyone I'm, wants to ask a question, you have to um, put your hand up. Sorry, maybe. So now you can raise your hand, you can ask. Um, okay. I see a question by Emmanuel Bomza. Emmanuel? Emmanuel? You have your microphone off, I think. Now it's on. Yes. Hi. Thank you very much for both very interesting talks. To both speakers, I have, I have a question to Victor yep. concerning excess mortality as a consequence of the austerity measures after the economic crisis 2008. I think of countries like Greece, Portugal. Is there any evidence that these austerity measures influenced mortality? Um, yes, definitely. So there is a stream of, of, re of research on these topics, the health consequences of economic crisis. And uh, indeed, there is for the, um, for the, great, res for the great recession um, and crisis uh, in Greece uh, in particular. Um, I don't have the, the studies in, in mind uh, exactly, but, uh, but there is uh, evidence that, um, I mean, when people lose their income and lose their jobs, it's det detrimental to their, to their health in general. Um, now, I, I don't know if this uh, topic has been explored um, in that great details um, for the very long run scaring effects about for the Great Recession, but that's, uh, I think that's a um, uh, definitely valid hypothesis um, to, to explore. And this is where, uh, when I discussed about the, the interactions between the two types of crisis, this is um, certainly an application of this, of this idea. Um, okay, so may I, may I ask, uh, just as a follow-up, is it, is, it, is there a chance to get these results or some fair comparison? Let me phrase like this, some, some, some unbiased comparison between the crisis in the 1930s and the crisis in subprime crisis and, and follow-up crisis. Because these are long-term, as you said, long-term effects and we are basically just too close to the other. Mm -hmm. Is there any method to to rescale the effect so that we can do a comparison? So, no, that's a very, very, uh, very interesting point. Um, just before I answer exactly to that, uh, in general, whenever you do, um, uh, when you want to draw some inference from historical cases, uh, there is always a trade-off if you want to, to put that in line with the current situation. The advantage of history is that it gives you a very long-run perspective but the, the main issue is that the far, more far back in time you go, the less comparable things are. Uh, so the advantage of the Great Recession is that you can look at some long-run consequences in the 1980s when people are 60 or 70 years old, and something that you cannot do with the Great Recession today. But of course, the context of the time and the margins it affected were very different. So here, to answer your question, there is no magic uh, method. It's, it's about understanding. If you want to draw this type of comparison, you have to understand well. Um, how both crises um, kind of affected um, incentives and choices uh, and affected people uh, to understand how, whether these, these comparisons are valid or not. So here, um, it's a bit, <laughs> every time in research, you don't have definite answers, it, more, it raises more questions. Uh, I, I would think that you have to be really careful when you draw these comparisons. To some extent, those are, those are somehow valid, but you have to, to, to be a bit careful, um, uh, for sure. Thank you, Victor. So there is one question much. here, I think, to Astrid, which is, uh, what research has been carried out uh, in societies where masks are already a normal part of life? Um, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, so actually, um, it's, it's mainly Asian countries uh, that are, um, that have this tradition of wearing masks already in everyday life. Um, and I mean, just uh, concerning one-to-one um, -one interactions, there is, it's a little bit complicated because uh, Asian culture is very different with respect to many other things already. Uh, uh, so so it's, it's, it's kind of difficult to, to compare these uh, kind of groups uh, and, and conclude that it's due to the fact that these countries have been wearing masks. But um, just one thing, so for example, but this is, as I say, it's, it's difficult. So people from 
Asian countries are usually much more focused on eyes to determine whether someone um, uh, is smiling or not. Um, but this um, might also be because they are just um, um, very often, they, 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 they have less this habit of making these big ex extreme smile uh, mouse uh, expression basically that you have very often in, in Europe or in, in North America. Um, and in, in, in Asia, basically, the smile goes much more through the eyes. But I don't say that this is because of the masks. It's just, uh, yeah. Thank you. So just one last question, but it's to both of you. Could each one of you say uh, what you think is going to be the most lasting impact of COVID overall in your respective research domains? Yeah. Victor, you want to go first? <laughs> uh. I mean, there are, there are so many dimensions. It's hard, hard, hard to to focus on one. So, if I if I had to, to to think of one that comes to mind right away, it's uh, uh, it's the scarring effect of the, uh, of entering the labor force during a recession, and that's a very uh, a difficult problem to solve because you have some um, crowding effects. Those so now now that people can um, shift a bit their entry in the labor force, this has exter negative externalities on other cohorts of people, and so. It's always difficult. So when you, whenever you want to have a welfare analysis, uh, it's unclear whether uh, you have to so-called sacrifice one cohort and then the others are going to carry on as before, or is it better to kind of wait and kind of spread out um, the, well, the negative welfare effects on everyone. Um, so that, that's one thing. And the other thing on that is, is that uh, we saw with the Great Recession that it had very last, long-lasting consequences. And that's what I'm worried the most about, um, I think. And that, that's why I think we can have somehow clear policy recommendations for if you, for governments to to uh, target policies toward the people who are right now uh, between 18 and 25. I think that's um, that's important. Okay, so from my point of view, so regarding just um, um, interactions, I think one. Um, interesting thing, and maybe let's start. Let's finish on a positive note. Is is that I mean, for 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 decades, people have been saying, "Oh, we have all these tools for online interactions." I mean, video communication is, is nothing new, but it never really took off. People never really used it because it always seemed difficult and it always seemed cumbersome. And but 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 people really never really tried to find solutions to it or to to get over it. And now the in kind of interesting experiment that happened is that over months, uh, companies and individuals were forced just to communicate like that. And of course, you can, uh, in the beginning, people were just, oh, we'll just deal with it. But now, since it keeps going on, and we also, we don't even know how soon it will be over, people also try to find better solutions, how to make it better, so to, to make interactions more natural uh, and, 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 and more productive. And I think the long-term consequences of that might be that maybe some of this will stick around, uh, namely those uh, tools that have proven to be effective tools. And uh, in, in the other cases, we actually, we learned actually why, why they're not so effective. So I hope that uh, maybe one of the positive effects uh, of this crisis will be that we'll be able to, to maybe uh, use these tools in a better way, reduce maybe travels in some ways and, and communicate uh, more effectively. Well, thank you very much to both of you. Thank you. And I think that uh, there are quite a few questions still, but we don't, uh, unfortunately, we don't have time for those. Um, but thank you so much to all of you who have attended as well. And as, as uh, Caroline is saying, the video will be viewable and the slides will be made available. And uh, we also welcome you to check out the website of TEC for upcoming uh, webinars uh, on the consequences of COVID and other societal, societal issues. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, and stay safe. Thank you very much.